Hey dear, welcome back to the world of cross-dressing stories. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. Now, let's dive into the story. England, 1996. As I sit by the window of my stone cottage, the one that has sheltered me for more than two decades now, I can't help but feel the weight of years and secrets press against my aging bones. This cottage, with its ivy-clad walls and small paned windows, has become a part of who I am, Miss Laura of Rose Cottage, a figure of mild curiosity and gentle respect in the village. It's a quiet evening, the kind where the shadows grow long and merge into the dusk, blurring the lines between day and night, past and present. The gentle rustling of the leaves and the distant calls of the evening birds stir memories long buried under the facade I've carefully maintained. For years, I've been the enigmatic old lady with an accent that hinted at a foreign past, a woman of manners and grace, yet someone who never quite belonged. The villagers know little of the life I've led, the lives I've lived before I became Miss Laura, and perhaps it was best that way. But as I grow older, the need to tell my story, to confess the truth of my life becomes overwhelming, a cathartic release from the decades of silence. With a deep breath, I power on the old computer, a clunky electronic gizmo that feels alien under my fingers, which are more accustomed to the softness of yarn and the feel of garden dirt. I begin to type, hesitantly at first, as if each word were a step back in time. My story starts not here, amidst the rolling hills of England, but in the picturesque landscapes of Switzerland, where I was born, Leslie Hillary Smith, in 1929. That life, the first chapter of my existence, feels like a tale from another world, filled with the innocent clatter of a child who knew nothing of what the future held. I was a curious child with bright eyes and a restless spirit, often found wandering the banks of Lake Geneva, lost in my thoughts and dreams. My parents, caught up in their own tangled stories, left me much to my own devices. My father, a stoic man hardened by war, and my mother, a delicate beauty, lost in her melancholy, were like figures from a storybook, both distant and deeply loved. As I recount these early memories, the keys of the computer clack under my fingers, echoing in the quiet cottage like the ticking of a clock. It's strange how the heart can hold both fondness and sorrow so tightly intertwined, how the past can feel both distant and immediate. I pause, my hands hovering over the keyboard, as I consider how much to reveal. The truth of my life is not just mine, but a tapestry woven with the threads of many others' lives. Each word I write feels like a step on a bridge between who I was and who I became. Deciding to leave some secrets for later, I press on, describing my childhood adventures, the whispered conversations of adults I didn't understand, and the shadow of the mountains that seemed both a protector and a prison. It was in those mountains I first dreamed of becoming someone else, someone who could cross borders and explore the vast world beyond. This narrative, this bedtime story of my life, is filled with echoes of laughter, the rustle of silk dresses I wasn't supposed to wear, and the quiet sighs of the night wind. It's a gender-bender story of survival and transformation, of a little boy who would become Miss Laura, and of the many masks we wear to protect our most authentic selves. So as the twilight deepens into night, I continue to write, my story unfurling like the night-blooming flowers in my garden, revealing their scents and colors to the moonlight, whispering, remember, remember who you were, embrace who you are. This story time, this sharing of my life is my legacy, a bridge built from words leading back to me, to all the versions of myself that I've been and the secrets I've carried through the years. The day started like any other, with the sun casting a gentle glow over the peaks of the Alps, its rays piercing through my bedroom window and promising yet another serene day in Montreux. I was eight, full of the quiet joy that only a child can know, innocent to the ways of the world and its looming shadows. That morning, the clatter of dishes and the murmur of voices in the kitchen didn't reach my ears as they usually did. The house felt unusually silent, the kind of silence that presses against your ears and makes your heart beat a little faster. I dressed in haste, the fabric of my school uniform rough against my skin, as I prepared for another day of lessons and laughter. Walking through the empty hallways, a sense of unease grew with each step. Where was everyone? Why hadn't Mama come to wake me with her soft kiss and a whisper of, Bonne journée, mon cher? 
The school seemed a world away as I made my way down the path, the gravel crunching underfoot, the lake's surface shimmering like a mirror under the morning sun. It was beautiful, but the beauty felt distant, as if I was looking at it from the other side of a thick glass wall. The day at school passed in a blur. Words and numbers danced before my eyes, incomprehensible and fleeting. My mind was at home, in the empty house, in the silence that awaited me. The final bell, which usually signaled freedom, now sounded like a tolling, calling me back to something unknown, something unsettling. Walking back home, the weight of an impending storm seemed to press down upon my shoulders. The house, as I approached, looked unchanged, and yet everything felt different. I pushed the door, half expecting to see Mama bustling around or hear Papa's deep voice rumbling from the study. But there was nothing. Just silence. And then I saw it. A piece of paper lying on the hall table, weighed down by the old brass letter opener that Papa used. The handwriting was unmistakably Mama's, the loops and whirls of her script tinged with haste. My hands trembled as I unfolded the letter, my eyes scanning the words that would change everything. My dearest Leslie, by the time you read this, I will be gone. I cannot tell you everything now, but know that this is for the best. You must go to Paris, to your Aunt Matilda. She will take care of you. I have arranged everything. There is money and a passport in the top drawer of my desk. Be brave, my love. I am so sorry, Mama. The paper seemed to burn in my hands. Gone? Why? Where? Questions spiraled in my mind, each one spinning tighter around my heart. I stumbled to the desk, found the envelope with the money and the passport, documents that felt too heavy for their size. Each item was a stone, pulling me further away from the world I knew. That night, I packed a small bag with trembling hands, each item a memory, each memory a sharp jab of confusion and fear. Why did Mama leave? What was so wrong that she couldn't even say goodbye? The train ride to Paris the next morning was a journey through a fog of emotions. The landscape rushed by, a blur of greens and browns, the world moving even as I felt stuck in that moment of reading the letter. I clutched the teddy bear Mama had given me on my last birthday, a small protector in a world that suddenly felt so big, so intimidating. Paris, the city of lights, of dreams, was waiting for me. But as the train pulled into the station, those dreams felt distant. I stepped onto the platform, a small boy with a suitcase too big, a heart too heavy. My journey had just begun, the first steps into a life that would be marked by the shadows of that day, shadows that whispered of secrets and changes, and a new identity that awaited me in the arms of an aunt I barely knew. Unknowing of the challenges ahead, I moved forward, each step a mixture of dread and hope, the city's cacophony, a stark contrast to the silent goodbye of a mother who had vanished with the morning mist over Lake Geneva. Arriving at L'Ecole Saint-Germain was like stepping into a new world, a world that was both terrifying and wondrous in its complexity and beauty. The tall iron gates, the ivy-clad walls, and the hushed voices of girls in uniform formed the backdrop of my new life, a life where I, Leslie, had to become Leslie. Aunt Matilde, a stern but fair woman with sharp eyes and a no-nonsense manner, met me at the school. Her initial shock at discovering the truth, that her niece was actually her nephew, was palpable. However, she composed herself quickly, understanding the gravity of my mother's decision and the necessity of maintaining my disguise. We shall make it work, she murmured more to herself than to me as we walked through the corridors of my new home. The concierge, Madame Leblanc, who I later learned was called Annette by those who knew her well, became an unexpected guardian angel. Her stern facade hid a warm heart, one that seemed to recognize and empathize with the fear and confusion that must have been evident in my eyes. With her help and Aunt Matilde's guidance, I was transformed. My boyish haircut was grown out, styled into soft waves that framed my face, and my wardrobe was replaced with the skirts and blouses of my classmates. The first few weeks were the hardest. I stumbled through my new routines, each step feeling like a misstep. The other girls whispered, their eyes curious and sometimes cruel. I felt exposed, like a fraud about to be discovered at any moment. It was during one of my lowest points, sitting alone in the corner of the schoolyard, that Annette found me. Don't let them see you're afraid, she advised, handing me a handkerchief for my tears. You are as much a girl as any of them in spirit, if not in body. Courage now, little one. 
Her words became a mantra for me, and slowly I found my footing. I learned to walk, talk, and carry myself like the other girls, mimicking their movements and mannerisms until they became second nature. My efforts at assimilation paid off as the whispers died down and were replaced by tentative friendships. One of these friendships blossomed into something deep and sustaining. Annette, a bright and kind-hearted girl who loved literature as much as I did, saw beyond the facade. We connected over shared books and whispered secrets, and she became my closest ally in a world that often felt like it was set against me. With Annette by my side, I found the courage to excel, not just to blend in. I threw myself into my studies, finding solace and expression in arts and literature, subjects that allowed me to explore and express the tumult of emotions that swirled within me. My teachers took notice and I earned their praise, which bolstered my confidence. Years passed, and the precariousness of my situation became a familiar companion, like a shadow always at my back, yet it did not define me. I was Leslie, a student of St. Germain, a friend, a budding artist, an identity forged in the fires of necessity but honed by love and determination. This chapter of my life, filled with both fear and triumph, taught me about the resilience of the human spirit and the boundless capacity of the heart to adapt and accept. Though I always knew that the safety of this new life hung by a thread, I also knew that I had found a way to live authentically, even under the most extraordinary circumstances. As the echoes of World War II reverberated through the cobblestone streets of Paris, a somber reality settled over L'Ecole Saint-Germain. The laughter and chatter that once filled the corridors were replaced by a tense silence, punctuated only by the distant rumblings of war and the urgent whispers of teachers preparing for the inevitable. The news came one crisp autumn morning. Paris was no longer safe. We were to evacuate to the countryside where the school hoped we would be insulated from the worst of the war's ravages. Anxiety gripped my heart as I packed my belongings. Every item I tucked away, a book, a photograph, a simple article of clothing, felt heavy with the possibility that it might be the last time I saw the familiar comforts of my school life. As we boarded the buses that would carry us away from the city, I felt the weight of my assumed identity pressing down upon me. The chaos of war threatened to upend the delicate balance I had maintained for so many years. I sat quietly, gazing out the window, watching as the city I had come to love slipped away into the distance, swallowed by the gray morning mist. The journey was fraught with tension. Military checkpoints dotted the route, each stop a potential exposure of my secret. At one checkpoint, a stern-faced soldier boarded our bus, his eyes scanning the frightened faces of my classmates. My heart pounded in my chest as he approached, each step echoing ominously in the silent bus. Your papers, he demanded gruffly. I handed him my forged identification, my hands trembling. He scrutinized the document, his gaze flicking up to meet mine. Time slowed, each second stretched taut with fear. Then with a grunt, he handed back my papers and moved on. Relief washed over me, but the fear of discovery haunted the rest of our journey. We arrived at a secluded chateau in the Loire Valley, its sprawling grounds a stark contrast to the cramped city. But the beauty of our refuge couldn't mask the war that raged just beyond its borders, nor could it soothe the turmoil within me. Maintaining my disguise in such close quarters became increasingly challenging as the daily realities of war stripped away our pretenses and heightened our emotions. One evening, as I bathed in one of the communal bathrooms, the door swung open unexpectedly. It was Claire, a girl who had always been suspicious of me. Our eyes locked in the mirror's reflection and a look of realization dawned on her face. Panic surged through me, but before Claire could speak, I acted. Please, I whispered urgently, I need your help. Something in my voice must have reached her the raw fear, the plea for understanding. Claire paused, then quietly closed the door behind her. In hushed tones, I told her a version of the truth, enough to explain without revealing everything. To my surprise, Claire's expression softened. I won't tell anyone, she said after a long moment. But why? For safety, I replied, the half-truth slipping easily off my tongue. It's the only way. Claire nodded, seemingly accepting this explanation, and left. Her silence in the following days spoke volumes of her acceptance, or perhaps her indifference. 
The war, after all, had taught us all how to carry secrets. As the months turned into years, the war raged on, but within the confines of our temporary home, life settled into a new rhythm. I continued to excel in my studies, finding solace in the arts and literature that had always been my refuge. The threat of exposure lingered, a shadow that followed me even into the sunlit gardens of the chateau, but it was a shadow I had learned to live with. Through it all, the camaraderie and challenges of our shared experience forged bonds that were both complex and profound. And while the war taught me about the fragility of life, it also taught me about the strength of the human spirit, about resilience, and about the capacity for kindness in the face of unspeakable challenges. The war left its indelible marks not just on the landscapes, but also on the souls of those who lived through it. As peace tentatively began to reassert itself across Europe, a deep yearning stirred within me, a longing for roots, for a place where I could plant myself and perhaps grow anew. My years at L'Ecole Saint-Germain had come to an end, and with them the necessity of maintaining the disguise of Leslie. It was time to forge a path forward as someone new, yet truer to the sum of my experiences. Stepping onto the English soil after years of war felt like walking into a familiar painting, one that had hung on the walls of my childhood imagination. The rolling hills, the patchwork fields, and the quaint villages were as I had left them, yet I viewed them through the eyes of someone irrevocably changed. My heart, heavy with memories and secrets, sought solace in anonymity. I chose a small village in the countryside, far enough from the bustling cities to offer seclusion, yet close enough to not feel isolated. It was there, in a quiet village cemetery, that I found Rose Cottage. The name, etched on a weathered gravestone, spoke to me of endurance and continuity, themes that resonated deeply with my bruised spirit. Adopting the name Laura, I began the delicate task of knitting together a new existence in this community. Rose Cottage became my sanctuary, a place where I could cultivate a garden and my new identity with equal care. I planted roses, of course, their blooms a testament to renewal and growth. Each petal unfurled like the layers of the life I built day by day. To the villagers, I was Miss Laura, the slightly eccentric but kindly woman who knew much about flowers and seemingly little about the harshness of the world. Community life was a tapestry of small events and interactions. I contributed quietly to village activities, always gracious, always a little apart. The local children would sometimes peer through the cottage gate, intrigued by the roses and the woman who tended them so lovingly. I would invite them in, tell them stories of faraway places and magical creatures, never touching upon the true tales of my own life's journey. Maintaining my secret became a matter of quiet dignity. There was no shame in my past, but revealing it felt unnecessary, perhaps because in doing so, I would unravel the very fabric of the peace I had found. Yet, the fear of discovery lingered, a shadow amidst the light of my tranquil days. Despite the solitude and the secrets, I found contentment. The villagers respected my privacy, appreciating the mystery of my past as part of my charm. In return, I offered them the best of myself, the listening ear, the gentle advice, and the endless beauty of my garden. Over the years, Rose Cottage became more than a home. It became a symbol of my resilience. The roots I planted in this community grew deep, mirroring the roots I sought to rediscover within myself. Here, amidst the blooms and the whispered tales of old, I found a measure of peace, a reconciliation of the many selves I had been and the one I had become. In the quiet moments, as I watched the sunset paint the sky in hues of gold and amber, I often reflected on the journey that had brought me here. From Leslie to Leslie to Laura, each identity was a chapter in a rich, complex life story. And though the world knew only the version I presented, I cherished the full narrative, holding it close like the roses in my garden, beautiful, thorned, and wholly mine. As the years wove silver into my hair and lined my face with the delicate tracings of age, the urge to recount my journey grew stronger, a final act of weaving together the threads of my life into a coherent tapestry that might one day warm another. The world had changed, and with it, perhaps, the readiness to hear a story like mine. With the quiet rustling of leaves in the garden and the steady tick of the clock marking time's passage, I began to write my memoirs at Rose Cottage, a sanctuary of peace and memories. Each word I type was a breath of my lived truth, 
a testament to the complexities of identity and the exquisite pain and beauty of becoming. My story spilled out, not just as a recounting of events, but as a reflection on the nature of self and the essence of acceptance. I wrote of the days spent in hiding, of the laughter and tears at L'Ecole Saint-Germain, of the fear that clutched my heart at each checkpoint during the war, and of the quiet, unassuming life I built in a small English village. Writing my memoirs was both liberating and daunting. It forced me to confront my past, to embrace each identity I had assumed. Leslie, the boy who loved the mountains of Switzerland. Leslie, the girl who survived a war and hid in plain sight. And Laura, the woman who found solace in the blooms of Rose Cottage. Each was a facet of my soul, each a character in a story that was uniquely and irrevocably mine. I pondered the fluidity of identity, the way it can be molded like clay, but also harden over time, defining us in ways we might not expect. I wrote of the masks we wear and the profound need for acceptance, not just from the world, but from ourselves. My words were a bridge for those who felt adrift between identities, a testament to the enduring strength required to forge one's path. As I aged, the physical act of writing became more challenging, but the need to finish my story propelled me forward. I wanted my memoirs to be a beacon for others, a light shining through the fog of confusion and fear that so often surrounds discussions of gender and identity. When my work was done, I felt a profound sense of completion, as if I had finally laid the last piece of a puzzle into place. The manuscript was my final gift to the world, a part of my legacy that I hoped would challenge, comfort, and inspire long after I was gone. My last days were spent quietly at Rose Cottage, among the gardens I had tended with love. The roses bloomed brilliantly that year, as if aware of their creator's impending departure. I passed away peacefully, surrounded by the beauty I had cultivated and the memories of a life fully lived. After my passing, my memoirs were published, touching the hearts of many. The revelations within the pages brought both shock and understanding, challenging societal norms and sparking discussions about the nature of identity and acceptance. My life, with all its complexities and transformations, stood as a powerful example of the transformative potential of acceptance and love. In the end, Laura of Rose Cottage remained a beloved figure, not only within her community, but also among those who found a piece of themselves in her story. Her legacy was one of courage, an invitation to embrace one's truth and a reminder that peace is often found not in clarity, but in accepting the multifaceted nature of our beings.